months. Yay. Um, about now, gosh, 14 years ago, I started this organization of the Consortium of Integrative Care Practitioners of Atlanta. We are MDs and DOs and DCs and NDs and DDSs and PTs and counselors and acupuncturists and herbalists, anybody that's interested in an interdisciplinary approach to wellness. And so we used to meet the first Monday of the month um, at the Amen Clinic in Atlanta and COVID has forced us to go virtual. So we've pivoted, we've mastered Zoom. And uh, so today our honored guest is a local guy. Um, Dr. Steve Ventola, many of you know, is a wellness chiropractor and a whole health educator who focuses on brain and gut health along with uh, stress reduction for the aging population. After teaching and coaching in West Orange, New Jersey public school system, he served as the community health educator, developing and presenting uh, pioneering wellness education groups to all ages of the general public. Through his work in health education, Dr. Ventola was drawn to the healing arts, and he then went on to attend Life University in Marietta, Georgia, where he continues to serve as a wellness chiropractor and health educator. In addition to chiropractic, Dr. Ventola is a certified heart math practitioner and certified stress trainer by the Holistic Stress Control In Institute of Atlanta. He considers our ability to handle stress in our lives to be our highest leverage for health. Um, and fascinating because I was doing a webinar last night as an alumnus of the University of Illinois, and they were talking about the role that stress plays in epigenetics in our at-risk populations at weakening their immune systems and making them more susceptible to COVID. Mm -hmm. And the really good story in the end of that was that um, it's modifiable, right? So that even though we have our highest risk populations on our Latinxes and our um, black population, Pacific Islanders, Native Americans are not doing well with COVID. Statistically, they handle it much more poorly. In part, it's because of their racially driven stress driven epigenetics. So now that we know that, and we know that stress in our lives is our highest leverage for health, Dr. Ventola would ask each one of you, how would you like to smile now? Are you interested in seeing new possibilities with your practice? Is fear or doubt getting in your way? Because if so, then you're in the right virtual room today because <laughs> today's presenter is a certified health practitioner, wellness chiropractor, a general gadget guy. Please welcome with your, our local stress expert, whole health educator, and super Andy Griffith fan, Dr. Steve Ventola. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Ellie. Hey, I wanted to begin the time just be beginning by saying, like, how are we handling this time? since March, since the shutdown there? Like, are we taking advantage of this time or are we just waiting for it to be over? So like, I know, remember my... Sorry. Sorry, 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 my bad. That's okay. All right, I have muted everybody to keep us all quiet and I accidentally muted the host. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where did I leave off? Uh, so how are we all handling ourselves during this COVID stress since March? Right. And in March, I don't know about you, Ellie and Zach, but my practice took a, took a hit. So I, weren't, I wasn't seeing as many people. So I knew I needed a pivot at that time. And luckily, I was doing a lot of lab work, which as a chiropractor, you know, chiropractors have to see patients. But because I was doing lab work, I was able to do virtual calls with my patients going over their lab work. But because I had less of a patient flow too, is that I was a, it gave me some more time to consider what other avenues I wanted to explore. And I've been doing a virtual, I've been doing a master stress with heart math meetup for the past few months, and I had to change it to a virtual call. And I noticed in the beginning of those times when I made it virtual that I was just at a loss in terms of how to do actually a group coaching call. So I, I said to myself, I got to learn more about doing like doing a better job with group coaching. And my brother, who's done lots of calls with online adult student education at Rutgers University, he gave me a lot of good pointers, uh, along with studying some other avenues to get this down better and how to do these these type calls. So. 
I'm here with you tonight, sitting here before with having learned some of these things. And I have one of my testimonials from my last participant in my last Master Stress with Heart Math meetup. And this is what Robin had to say. Yesterday was so necessary for me personally, and I was extremely impressed by the way you handle the group. Thank you for sharing your many gifts of positivity and high coherence. So that was a good comment that I had from her just to help along with, with my process of, of learning how to do these calls. And then along with saying for tonight, for the next 30 minutes of the time that we have together, I wanna help all of us, whether we're listening now with Zach, my brother and Carol on the phone there. And for those who might be listening to this recording, but how can we actually handle this situation not so much trying to wait for this COVID to be over, but to take full advantage. So let's begin with that in mind. So I'm gonna screen share. Yeah, Robin's little quote said, if she gives you a compliment of being in high coherence, it means she understands your heart math. Yes, yes, she does. Okay, so we're gonna be keeping our perspective as health prof professionals and let's begin. And for a few of us that are here, again, I think this kind of goes without saying, but just to say it is helpful, confidentiality. You know, basically I may be exerting, exerting some of the video of this talk. And if I do use it and there's something sensitively shared, I'll ask you for permission before I do that. Kindness and respect, mute if needed. So Ellie right now, she's Captain Mute person to make sure we're kept quiet in that respect. And thinking about kindness and respect, there's such polarity in today's world that we want to keep in mind a, a greater level of, of openness to each other. Being present, each, each of us plays a vital part and focus chat. So again, with the limited number of folks we have on the line right now, I, I like to emphasize in our chat, if there was more folks that you know, look to keep the chat focused on our conversation, so we're not diverting our attention. Okay, meeting overview. Let's check in perspective challenge. Okay, since there's a few of us, we can verbalize this if we'd like, like what perspective challenges we may have had. So anybody wanna offer anything in that respect? During this well, time? I would say for me, one of the hardest things about COVID has been trying to stay one step ahead of the patients in my level of education, mm -hmm. because we're getting stuff so hard and fast I was reading 20 hours a week, 25 hours a week, just on COVID to try to understand the epidemiology, how we were testing, where we could get tested locally, how we could take what was happening on a global scale, because early on, you know, it wasn't so much here in Atlanta, um, and then try to make sense out of all that, digest it, and keep calm in my patients. So that was challenging. It's a yes. little better now. I think we're kind of on yes. this wave of COVID on the yeah. downside. Yes. It will probably sign wave on us for a while, but right now we're on the downslope and that makes, on one hand, people a little more complacent, but on the other hand, a lot less nervous. Yes, Ellie, I think, yeah, that's, we seem to be moving along in that respect. Zach, do you have anything, any challenges you're having right now? Let me unmute him. Exactly. Yeah, um, I would definitely echo what Ellie said about um, kind of balancing the consumption of both data research and also media and news during this time. Um, uh, there's a lot of negative media to consume and a lot of the patients are bringing that up as well. And um, not only, you know, sort of balancing that with positivity in my own life, but also helping patients navigate that as well. It's been very challenging this year. And I've never seen a health topic so politically polarizing either. Absolutely. Um, even in the days of HIV, when everybody was afraid we were going to die from HIV before we understood it, um, it never was this polarizing. Um, and that's, that's an ugly place for our country to be. And COVID is one of like five active topics that are going on right now, all of which people are very impassioned about and, on both sides so it's been challenging steve you're muted
Zachary, are you, uh, what is your field? Are you a medical doctor? Oh, uh, yes. I'm a medical doctor, family medicine, integrative medicine as well, uh, mm -hmm. practicing in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Very good. Great to meet you. Likewise. Okay, and so getting into coherence. Now we have the challenge that we've been going through, but what does it take to stay coherent during this time so we can absorb the information that comes to us and discern and see how it, how it, how it applies? Okay, what stories do we tell ourselves as health practitioners, as health professionals? And changing the story. So let's start off with what makes us smile? What do you love for sure? So this is on the right hand side is our cat, our cat called Katniss, who we just adopted and she is seven years old and we every time we look at her, she makes us smile. I know Ellie, you just got two dogs too? We do. We have a nine month old Anatolian Shepherd Great Pyrenees puppies and they surely make us smile. Yes. So we want to think about what makes us smile. So what do you love for sure? Let's chat about that. Okay, so in the chat for the folks who are on the on the telephone line, or Zach, you want to pitch in? You guys can unmute yourselves. What makes you smile? Or if you want to write something in the chat, if you don't want to verbalize it. I also have two dogs. One's fourteen and one is nine. They make uh -huh. me smile. My two-year-old daughter, especially interacting with the dogs, makes me smile. And having her out in the garden, we just planted our fall garden yesterday, and that was. That made me smile. Cool. Very good. It's good to have that. I'm going to have to access my chat here. Let me see if I can do that. Okay. I'm always struggling when to plant the fall garden when the summer garden is still spitting out a few little things. I just feel like it's, you know, uh, premature death if yeah. I take this, the, the spring garden out too soon. I just took I mine out, Ellie. Yeah, <laughs> it up. Yeah. That was the best actual time to do it. Yeah. Okay, any, any other chats from the folks on the phone lines? Nature, nature makes me smile. Hiking, yeah. walking, hugging trees, hunting mushrooms, yeah. hunting blossoms, trying to learn the names of the sounds that I hear and the plants that I see. Yeah, um, I'll add to up here in New Jersey, we, the weather's been beautiful and I've been taking long walks in the morning before I see our students. I've been in the challenge I have with our students, I work at Rutgers, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, is the ability to still connect with them uh, through Zoom. And I find if I provide something positive and make it natural as best I can, and, uh, that, and they kind of come along, but it hasn't been easy. Like, believe they're in my office. Hmm. Good job. Yeah. yeah, you have a lot of close in interchanges there with students. With those things in mind, I had this to just kind of prime the pump here. For, for some of us, we love readings. We love certain books that make us smile. Kids may make us smile, places that visit. And in the deepest part of our heart, you think about what makes you smile, but what also brings the greatest sense of peace at the same time. So quick coherence exercise to get coherence. So with heart math, we recognize that if we breathe in slow and out slower, along with accessing the feeling of something you love and breathe that feeling in and out as through your heart, it helps to bring coherence. So let's practice that. So first thing we would do is focus our feeling intention on our heart and imagine your nose being on your heart and breathing in slow and out slower. Good thing too is uprighting ourselves, breathing in slow and out slower. And one more time, in slow and out slower. Okay, good, good. Okay, now we're thinking about what's going on now currently and our past, present and future. And here we see, you know, for all of us here, we all come from aberrant, you can say aberrant backgrounds. We've had some jagged past that may still influence now. And we wanna think about, okay, how can we get pre coherent in the present? So what extends out through us 
is something that is coherent. And with heart math, we're measuring heart rate variability and which can tell if there's actually a sound coherent, you'd say energy emanating from us. Okay. And another way of looking at this is you can say the universal order is constantly being sent to our nervous system. However, in the present moment, if we still have things we're sticking to in the past, that creates an interference pattern, which allows for something jagged to extend through us. So ideally, we want this to be just as smooth as this, this, these lines in order to, to let something really be sent into the world that is sound and coherent. So speaking of our past, what stories do we tell ourselves? What, what things do we get stuck on? For one, I've had a time with having to get things done now where I, I press myself, I think, beyond my nervous system limits and it's not healthy. So that's the story I've been telling myself, but what does it take to, to change that? This is one from Ellie, right? It has to be perfect. Okay, you want to add anything to that, Ella? Yeah, I, I think that as a, for everything that we do, like to, to present to the world about the things that we do, when we're creating a patient hand, handout, when we're doing a Zoom um, PowerPoint or a PowerPoint for a CME lecture that we're giving, or when we're making a, a podcast, we do it and redo it and redo it and redo it because we say it has to be perfect. This is a representation of me. And, you know, our, our knowledge base, especially in integrated medicine, is so grand that we feel like we have to be better than anybody else who's good at that subject. And we're our own worst enemy because it's just a little bit of what we want to share is more than enough for most people to digest. Mm -hmm. When we try to present in 60 minutes, they stopped digesting in 20 minutes. So we keep making perfect, perfect, perfect and all this other stuff and we're our own worst enemy. Mm -hmm. I have to be available to my phone all the time. How about that one too? Well, that's hard when you're integrative doctor and solo practitioner. Uh -huh. right? You kind of sort of have to be on your phone all the time because people uh, depend on you. Gotcha. Um, it is, it, it can be done to have a backup, but it takes a lot of work. Uh -huh. Do you find the same thing, Zach? Yes. All three of these are highly resonating with me. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Will I have enough money to get through this? as a concern for practitioners. A crisis is a bad thing. How are we seeing this again as an opportunity? What if, what if, right? And then any other stories come to mind or comment on the above? Yeah, my, my husband is the king of extremes. Everything is always or never in his mind. This always happens or this will never work. <laughs> right. So I think those are other stories that I hear people gotcha. tell themselves. Yeah, it's good to recognize our own stories and to recognize the stories of others and not, not to get entangled with either one. But that's an art, isn't it? It is an art to try to learn to leverage in the middle. Yes. Okay. So let's see what, how can we look at this in terms of we hold to these stories, you give them all the power and self-sabotage yourself. When you pause and recognize their effects, they lose some of their power. But when you respond in a different way, the story is changed. Changing the story. So I'm going to introduce a process that I've been working with for a while that I want to share with you tonight that I found very helpful in terms of changing my story, stories that come up. And I continue to change the stories and refine it. But I think sharing this process may help you too. That's why I'm excited about sharing this. So the idea is one of the most essential sources of light and biophoton emissions is DNA. Fritz Popp was quoted by saying that, and he recognized in his studies as a biophysicist that in essence, the substance of DNA has a luminescence to it. So you can say the DNA needs to actually get out to create the body, the design of our body through messenger RNA to create the proteins. So to go along with this, if you think of what Popp had realized for himself that we now know today that man is essentially a being of light, man, male, and female. 
Now, I wish Oscar was here tonight because I think he would have liked this quote. Where, let me see if I can move this here. You are a divine being, you matter, you come from realms of unimaginable power and light. And Terence McKenna was quoted as saying that, and he was the ethnobotanist who did a lot of experiments with psychedelic mushrooms. But I guess in one of his times that he had, he had that great realization. Jack's a mushroom guy too. Yep. Oh yeah, really, okay. Okay, the messenger RNA process, being a messenger of light. So recognizing, noticing for R, noticing the drop in your heart, observing the story emerging. Now, you know, when things happen during the day, do you notice when your heart starts to get impacted, like something's, something's hitting you and your heart's starting to drop? Have you noticed that? Took note of those times? Usually they're not good things. <laughs> right. So we want to neutralize those things. So like we did with the breathing exercise, uprighting ourselves, breathing from the heart, slow in, slower out. That activates our parasympathetic nervous system, as we know. And then at the same time, remembering what you love for sure. Appreciating, A, appreciating, reaffirming what is true. This is the truth I appreciate and love. Now, this is the process, but let me just help to spell this out a little bit better. So we have better application. So I'm gonna use my annotation here. And we're gonna do this here. Okay, so in this area, we see we wanna be aligned here. So we're being ideally a messenger of light. Now that light needs to be received into our heart and I like to say our heart needs to be kept in a position of thankfulness, appreciation, patience. And I add an extra P for, you can say, praise. Now, if you're not religiously inclined or in that respect, but praise for others. Praise, you know, seeing what's great about it in others so that you can give thanks for. And now our heart needs to be fixed in this way. And the way I've been coining it is our heart needs a rudder. And the rudder is our rudder is basically our conscious mind of our heart. So as our mind protects our heart to stay in a fixed position of thankfulness appreciation, patience, and praise. It allows for, you can say, our heart and mind to be in alignment. And here, we know that the mind and the subconscious, you know, physiologically, what I understand is connected through our solar plexus. So as there's alignment here, our solar plexus subconsciously, where the subconscious autonomic nervous system processes can occur, where what comes through our bodies, again, is something that is coherent, something that can extend through our bodies, that can extend a sound, healthy influence into the world. Now, now, this is where we're looking to see how the art, you can say the art of living. Here we go, we have Sharon entering. I'll admit, I'll admit Sharon, Ellie. Okay, so we want to- Oh, sorry, That's didn't okay. see her. That's okay. So we want to I'm learn how to live in- falling down in my job. We want to learn how to live in this alignment. Hi, Sharon. So, but when things come along, things come along that impact our heart. Problems come along. Now, as health professionals, Folks are coming to us with their problems. So how do we deal with those problems? And I looked up the word problem today, the root word, and problem is basically relates to something being pitched towards us. And you think of a baseball player, like a baseball player has to be agile, they have to be present, they have to be basically ready to handle pitches that come to us. And how do we handle the pitches that come to us from our patients, but actually also from our own thoughts, our own hearts and minds? the pitches that would cause us, cause our hearts to drop, where our mind here 
becomes a little twisted and we may not be thinking as clearly and our heart feels a little bit contracted and what happens at those points we might feel like let's see here everything is rushing in on us where things are collapsing in on us and that's where we have to recognize we have a choice in those moments to either default to patterns of shame, fear, hate, greed. Okay. But we have a choice in that moment to recognize. Now, you've heard of Viktor Frankl, you all? Yeah. Okay. And yeah, he, I mean. he has a quote saying that between stimulus and response, you think about stimulus and response, what's coming to us, the stimulus from the world, you can say, our own thoughts or from patients that we may be working with, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So when we get stimulated by things that may be impacting our heart, we recognize. R is for recognizing. Recognizing that in that moment, pausing, that we have a choice to either default to patterns of shame, fear, hate, you think about the hate in the world today, or greed, and we stop and we breathe, like the exercise that we just went over, and then we remember. We may remember what we love to help ground. Now, it might take a little time to get remembering back to what we love. That's where we look to breathe, upright ourselves, to help see, again, what's happening in the moment and what choice can I make? Rather than defaulting automatically to those patterns in the world of shame, fear, hate, and greed, as well as other patterns, worry, we actually choose to upright ourselves and remember and this in the moment helps with letting go of things that may be stuck in our own stories or letting go of entanglements we might find with patients there and which brings perspective. We might need to apply an element of forgiveness even for ourselves. And I like to say of letting go to, letting go to as we rise up in our awareness of, I call it the peace of understanding, where we begin to recognize why we may have felt defaulted to patterns before or why others may have defaulted those patterns and we understand and we're large. We, we can see larger than what that person we may be working with might be dealing with to help them along which allows for, you can say, a reassumption of our rightful place of appreciating the place we fill in the world and allowing for that influence again to be extended in, into the world. And here you can say, we find a rightful association with others. And we find an affinity with others that we can associate with to allow for a greater influence to be extended. And you, th you think of this too, like transformation happens here when we recognize and we neutralize and then we move into appreciation in a greater sense of affirmment of what we're about. And, and I like using the biblical quote, here you can say, lo, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but, I, you know, but I'm still assured, I fear no evil. We recognize the pro process there. We're actually like a good batter in baseball where problems are pitched to us but we're ready to handle those, those pitches because we're understanding. We can, we can see the ball coming and we can anticipate what's, what's about to happen and we can hit, hit the ball either for a single or a double or tripler or a home run. But we, we're playing our part to extend an influence of, of light into the world, being a messenger of light.
So along with this, I've created a upcoming course called Transforming Self-Sabotage, Awaken from the Stupor, Awaken from the Defaults that typically a lot of us may get into at times and to see how we can awake from that, from that stupor. And I'm going to begin that coaching program October 15th to Thursday night at 7.30, which I'm looking forward to share more of my realizations and to see how we can actually move along together so we can support each other in that respect. And if you have an interest in that, you can go to this uh, link here and find out more in that respect. Tiny, tiny dot CC transforming self sabotage all small caps. Okay. And you think about as the world awakens, prepare to lead, work together. Okay, so you think about, again, we're not in this just to be a light on our own. We're in this to be a light with each other. And basically, you, you can think about COVID, even the, the political divisiveness that's going on. All this is like almost, in, it's encouraging in a way, an awakening for all of us, for our own internal integrity to rise up. And as that's happening, as, especially as health pr practitioners, is to be in position to lead to actually know a little bit more of anticipating what may happen and, and lead the way for others who may be a little bit undiscerning of what's going to happen, but helping to give a greater understanding. So that's what I wanted to share tonight. So talk about, Steve, to me, um, some real practical aspects of this. So we often will have acute stressors that come into our life that make our heart sink. Mm -hmm. And then we have more chronic stressors. Yes. Is the strategy the same? You know, that's a good question, Nell. You know, it, it all depends there, but the biggest thing is, is recognizing when you can say your vibration, your energies drop when your heart begins to be impacted. To, to recognize those moments, and it could be small things, or it could be larger. Like there could be more immediate crisis experiences there and that might again it might take a little time to get back to remembering to neutralizing that and that's where like when something severe happens we want to just remember let's upright ourselves let's breathe right. well, let's get in a position I mean, for example i um i had a phone call last friday when some other man's voice is on your daughter's phone and says your daughter's had an accident please meet her at the ambulance at the hospital really? right that's a terror. We yeah. have people right now with wildfires escaping. So you can't exactly stop in the middle of an evacuation to breathe and upright yourself, right? So, so how do you handle in the short term? Like I'm, I'm escaping, all right, the flames are behind me, now I can see I'm safe, but then now I have to deal with going forward a short term crisis or bigger. Right. Let's say I'm one of those horrible victims whose homestead's been burnt to the ground and I have nothing now. So yeah. how do I use your strategies to both deal with my short term and my long term recovery? Well, again, great considerations there. You know, one thing, again, when a moment comes along, you I mean when a crisis, an emergency happens, you got to get out. You got to do whatever necessary that you can reflexively handle. But then when a moment comes along, you know, one thing with heart math they stress is taking time when in your quiet moments. So you have some, some reserve and some built up resiliency so you can be a little more agile to handle the things that do come along. But again, you know, that takes some practice. But it takes some some doing to take advantage of our quiet times. And you think back in March when my practice went down or when we got a little slower, to take advantage, what can we do during those quiet times to move to actually build a reserve so we don't even know what may come next, but we're in a position to be a little bit more agile. And in your own routine, what time of day do you like to do your heart math? It, right in the morning is the best time I find because it helps set the tone for the day. But in the evening time is a real important time. I'm sure like each of us probably has an evening routine. 
that an evening and morning routine is so essential for us to stay on track because those are two specific leverage times to really to really take note of and to practice you know the last thing you read before you go to sleep is works the most on your subconscious the most or last thing you see there and then in the morning you know doing heart math doing your exercises like i'll do the five rights every morning and i'll combine that with heart math and um are you I lost my train of thought. Are you <laughs> practicing um, heart math on a daily basis, multiple times, once a day? You're pretty expert at it by now. Yeah. But the, the beginners, the, yeah, go ahead. The beginners, just once a day. Is it five minutes? Is it fifty minutes? What does it look like? You know, I find at least doing it in the morning. Okay. However, like you know, at times I'll do it before I start seeing patients when I get to the office. You know, hard math recommends practicing five minutes in the morning, five minutes at lunchtime, and then five minutes before you go to sleep. Okay. I find, I found personally, if I do it in the morning, it's, it sets the tone for the day. And then because I'm working with, with my patients, I do heart math with each of my patients. So I'm practicing heart yeah. math all throughout the day, which has right. been very helpful. Yeah. Right. Zach, do you do heart math? Is that... I don't personally do heart math. I'm more of a yoga person, but it's definitely something I should probably consider adding. It's interesting. I'm in a physician's um, group on Facebook and we call it our brain trust or um, our lounge. And there was a conversation about heart math last week, I think. And um, probably 15 practitioners in a row chimed in and said, number one thing in my practice, every patient's required to do it. If they're not gonna do heart math, I won't let them be my patient. Uh -huh. It's like so integral to their ability to get the patient centered yeah. to accept whatever it is they're offering next. That's excellent, so, Ellie. Yes, it is very helpful. Like every patient that comes in, I, I put the heart math sensor on them while I'm adjusting them. Cause I know like, I can see the changes neurologically with them as I'm, as I'm taking care of them. Okay. One thing, Zach, too, you know, with yoga, when I do my five rights, which is kind of a yoga motion type activity, I use the sensor while I'm doing the exercises. So it's an easy thing to do when you're doing yoga. You, awesome. know? And you can actually see doing yoga, whether you are in coherence while you're doing it, which can accentuate yeah. your practice. Yeah, one of the, one of the practitioners said, he practiced yoga and meditation for 20 years and until he got heart math he was never truly centered mm. so he was shocked at how short of the mark he was until he learned his how to reach coherence yeah. you know you should sometimes say that ellie because the founder of heart myth doc children have you known his story no okay. well basically he was a southern christian Who's, who at the time was reading a lot, praying a lot, going to church a lot, but he wasn't making the sense of communion he felt with God that he felt he needed to. So he started ingeniously starting to just consider what it would take in that respect. And out of that grew heart math. Interesting. Yeah. And now they have trainers that go into churches, but they also, also heart math has non-dogmatic dogmatic ways too, where they'll go into other business organizations to help tr help train people into coherence. But you know, if you are religiously or spiritually inclined, it does help create a greater sense of union there. God communion, I find. Karen, do uh, you want to introduce yourself? Well, I'll unmute you. You have too. to unmute you. If you can't okay. unmute yourself, you got it. Yes. Hi, well, I'm Sharon Dugan. And Dr. Ventola and I have been friends from a long time ago because uh, I was a, a patient of Millie Holiday's. So uh, I, think, I think you were in her office at the time. And then through the years, we lost contact. But then I, he started sending me emails about his courses. And I just asked him, I said, you know, I'm always signing up for different classes. But, you know, which one do you think would really help me? And so he mentioned the self-sabotage. So I've actually done the, the lessons for that class that's amazing it's yeah. just i said to him i said it like it's like putting the meat on the bones uh -huh. you know for the self-criticism that kind of runs that um mm -hmm. 
thing in your head. And I'm a lot better than I used to be, but I felt like the class really helped. And then it's really been encouraging what y'all are saying about the heart math because I haven't, I've got the sensor. <laughs> it's like, okay, now I need to jump into it and start using it. I mean, I have my morning routines where I do meditation and, yeah. and different things and, and exercise, but I really do want to start measuring my coherence. I feel like I can check my body because I've taken enough classes where they encourage you to just listen to your body. So then I would start breathing when I felt my body was talking to me 